Okay, hello, and thank you for joining us for this Lawyers for Learners webinar, Estate Planning 101. This presentation will be recorded and uploaded to the Lawyers for Learners YouTube channel. We welcome your questions. Please submit any questions you may have in the Q&A section of the chat, and they will be addressed at the end of the presentation. My name is Contessa Gansky, and I'm a legal intern with Lawyers for Learners. I'm excited to present our speaker for today's webinar, Attorney Jama Graves, partner at Kirk Graves & Nugent. Jima practices primarily in the areas of estate planning and real estate and has taught at UW Law School and Viterbo University. Thank you, Jema, for joining us today and sharing your expertise on the topic of estate planning. Take it away, Jema. Thank you. I uh, am excited today to have the opportunity to talk to you about estate planning and why, uh, in my opinion, everyone that is over the age of 18 in Wisconsin should, uh, if not have these documents in place, at least be having conversations about these documents. Uh, to say you're passionate about estate planning might sound a little odd, but the uh, documents that we're going to be talking about are so important and can save you and your loved ones uh, so much uh, time, expense, and uh, emotional expense that with a few simple things, uh, you can really have in place a concrete estate plan that is going to last you for years. Obviously, uh, an estate plan is somewhat fluid as our life changes, and we might go from being a student to married or having children or wherever our life may take us. So uh, it is something that we advise that people review periodically, but um, a lot of the documents that we're going to be reviewing today are things that will be uh, good for you in the future uh, for quite some time. And one question I get asked is why, if I am a young person, if I have, uh, I'm in school, why would I need these documents? And one reason for that is because many people think of an estate plan as something that we need after we die, but that is really not a true estate plan. When we talk about an estate plan, we're talking about not only what happens to our things after we die, but what happens while we're alive, but if we're unable to pay our own bills or make our own healthcare decisions. So those are some of the topics that we're going to be covering today. And again, as I said earlier, even if you do not go right out and get these documents, I encourage you to start having conversations about these documents with your loved ones, with your friends, with whoever it is that might step in if something should happen to you. To uh, begin the presentation today, I thought we would review uh, some of the terminology that is common in estate planning. Uh, it is an area of the law that changes pretty slowly. And so there is still a fair amount of what I would call legalese or uh, some boilerplate in documents. But let's review a few of the more basic terms. Uh, as you can see up on the screen, uh, terms that are more related to after someone has died. Uh, the word decedent simply means the person who is deceased. Heir, we hear that word a lot, but what does it really mean? It's who would inherit if there is no will. Uh, an heir is uh, if you have no children, it's your parents and then your siblings. And if you do have children, then your heir is usually your children. Uh, beneficiary, that's a person that you have named or designated in a will or other document. The most uh, common uh, and the easiest for people to think of is a uh, beneficiary is named in an insurance policy. If you have a life insurance policy, you uh, designate who receives that when you die. That is a beneficiary designation. The next term is probate, and that is a process through which courts uh, administer and uh, oversee the distribution of assets and payment of debts that someone would leave behind. The next terms are testate and intestate, and that simply refers to testate as you have a will, 
intestate means you do not have a will. And finally, we have last will and testament and uh, or trust. And those are written means of transferring assets to your beneficiaries. Um, the next documents we will review are uh, if are commonly more uh, used when we're talking about somebody who has had a life event, being it a health event or uh, a um, accident or something like that. And that is a healthcare power of attorney. And that is a document that designates an agent to make medical decisions and health related decisions for you. Uh, but it's only active when two doctors have stated in writing that you are not able to make those decisions for yourself. The next is a power of attorney for finances. The most commonly used is what's called a durable power of attorney. And that is both effective and active when you sign it. And it's where you would designate an agent to make financial decisions, pay bills, uh, take care of your uh, financial affairs if something should happen to you. And finally, we have guardianship. And some of you may have heard of guardianship, but it is a court process with uh, court oversight that allows um, a family or a friend or loved one to uh, make decisions for a person or pay their bills if they don't have a healthcare power of attorney or a power of attorney for finances. And uh, the goal in uh, some of this discussion today will be to have you uh, have the knowledge to go out and get these documents so that you can help your family and loved ones avoid guardianship. Uh, it's an expensive process and it's usually in a time of crisis, especially for someone young, because it's usually again after a health event or an accident. And if we do these other simple documents, we can uh, avoid having to put our uh, loved ones through that process. Uh, next, uh, on the next slide, we will uh, start with talking about uh, what happens upon death and our basic estate planning documents. And when we die, there are different ways to transfer assets. And one of those is uh, through a will, and that is where you leave a document that says what you want to have happen to your assets and who's going to be in charge. Uh, with a will, the good thing about that is you decide who gets what and someone is in charge and you've designated that person. So it's someone of your choosing. If you don't have a will uh, and you have assets over $50,000, there is still a process uh, that, you know, with the intestate succession that we talked about that someone would step forward and would administer your assets and make sure they get distributed to your heirs at law. Now, why a will can be important is uh, you may say, well, I don't really have any assets or I don't have that much. And that may be true, but if something does happen, having a document that says who you want to be in charge of taking care of a vehicle or bank accounts or things like that uh, is definitely helpful guidance to uh, those who are wondering um, what it is you would want done. You can designate a charity for proceeds. You can uh, decide what you want to have done. And those uh, you know that have to figure that out have some written direction. Um, you can also uh, designate a uh, assets with transfer on death designations called TOD, sometimes called payable on death, uh, POD. And this is, uh, as I discussed before, like an insurance policy, you can leave a beneficiary designation. Uh, investment or financial accounts, you can often uh, make beneficiary designated even your bank accounts so that if something happens to you, 
someone can access your bank account if you have died and be able to pay bills or do what needs to be done. Uh, then also you can do that with real estate. If you own a house, we can now do a transfer on death deed and that allows that asset to avoid probate. Uh, the transfer on death designations are a way to pass assets to your loved ones without a probate process. The last will and testament uh, brings in the probate process, but sometimes there are reasons that we do want to have things go through probate. And sometimes it is we have issues with people that uh, maybe our beneficiaries can't get along or we have someone that has some spending issues and we just need to make sure there's some court oversight for those assets. Uh, one of the documents off to the left of the screen you'll see is a HIPAA release. I don't go in depth in any of this into a HIPAA release but I do want to talk to you a little bit about it. And it's essentially a document that you sign that allows your loved ones to have access to your medical records in the event that you might not be incapacitated, you might still have your full faculties, but if something happens and you are taken to a hospital, let's say you're at college and you are taken to a hospital or clinic, and your parents are not always able to get the information that they would like because you're an adult and HIPAA policies now apply to you. And having this document and having your parents or a loved one have this can often be helpful if there is uh, an emergency. On the next screen, uh, we talk about uh, a little bit about trusts and I'm going to talk about this but not go into uh, in I'm not going to go into too in depth in this because this really is more advanced and not estate planning 101 but a lot of people have heard of trusts and there are different kinds of trusts and I uh, you know there might be a point in your life where a trust is something that you need for your estate plan. So this will give you a little bit of an overview into those trusts. Uh, first, we have a revocable or a living trust. Sometimes those were called loving trusts. This uh, is a trust that a lot of people like because any assets you put into it, you fund it while you're alive. Any assets you put into it are a uh, not going to have to go through probate. Your upon a person's death or incapacity, the successor trustee steps in and can administer their assets as the trust sets forth. It really doesn't have any tax benefits. It has no. Uh, it doesn't protect assets from creditors. Um, if they were funded after 2014, there's really no protection from long-term care costs but it is avoid probate and if you have a beneficiary that you don't think is ready to receive an inheritance you can have that in place uh, and it kind of uh, can help protect them from themselves uh, the next type of trust is an irrevocable trust and that assists with uh, tax and nursing home uh, asset protection um, it is subject currently, there's a five-year look back if you put assets into this trust. Um, and when I say a look back, I mean that if you're trying to, if so, you anticipate somebody's going to go into long-term care and you're trying to protect an asset and you put it into this trust, <clears throat> excuse me, there's going to be a five-year look back uh, during which time that asset is still uh Medicaid or whoever could put a lien on it. Um, the nice thing about irrevocable trusts is they are private. Uh, none of the beneficiaries have a chance to contest a will and it avoids probate. So the biggest thing with that is the person establishing the trust permanently relinquishes that asset. And that's why it's called irrevocable because once you give up those assets, uh, they are out of your possession. So these are uh, 
used more for people that might have an estate tax issue or really are uh, facing a significant health event and looking at long-term care because it is a more drastic uh, type of trust. And finally, we have a special needs trust. And this uh, is a trust that is often used uh, to qualify uh, someone for benef benefits or uh, disability and to make sure that they maintain those benefits. Um, it can be drafted by an attorney. There's a wonderful group in Wisconsin uh, called WISPACT. Uh, they have what's called a pooled trust. So there are a lot of options out there for that. Moving to our next screen. Uh, we're going to, this talks about powers of attorney. And with the power of attorney, these are documents we've talked about wills and trusts, and those are uh, more for the purpose of this conversation, uh, dealing with what happens after we die and how can we distribute those assets. The power of attorney documents we're going to be talking about are especially important for everyone over the age of 18. And these talk about what if I am alive, but uh, I'm not able to make my own health care decisions or pay my own bills? And uh, what a document Wisconsin uses is called a health care power of, an, of, of attorney. And with this document, it is, as I said before, uh, effective when you sign it, but it is not what we call activated until two doctors would state in writing that you cannot make your own health care decisions. So it's a document that uh, really does not come into play until you have had an incapacitating event. Um, you can only name one agent. Uh, you cannot have co-agents that act as your health care power of attorney. And you can uh, appoint an alternate agent, but it definitely uh, is a position that you want to make sure that who you are appointing is able to make a tough medical decision and is able to live with that decision and is someone that can communicate with the other family members. Uh, so often in times of crisis, communication is key. And when we're talking about healthcare powers of attorney, uh, communication is also important as far as you talking to your agent or your designated agent. Um, these documents cannot possibly address every issue that could happen to a person as far as an accident or a disability. So the document does its best to cover a range of areas and with the choices in this document, you can limit the power of a turn or the powers of your agent, or you can make them quite broad and expansive. And that depends upon who you have as your agent, your trust level with them, and your general philosophy about your health care. Um, but I, it sounds trite, but we tell people talk, talk, talk about these documents because your healthcare power of attorney should know what you want and when you want it to happen. And so the power of these documents is the conversations that you have about them. And again, the power of the healthcare power of attorney is directly related to the conversations you have about that document. I cannot stress that enough. Um, what is the big deal if you don't have one? If you don't have one and you cannot make your own healthcare decisions because you are incapacitated, and this is going to go on for a period of time, your family will have to go to court or your friends or your spouse, whoever it might be, and get a guardianship. And they'll have to petition for a guardianship of your person or and or your estate. And it is thousands of dollars and it is um it's a stressful process during a stressful time so 
I cannot overemphasize the healthcare power of attorney. Uh, then the financial or durable power of attorney is a document that is a little different than the healthcare power of attorney in that it deals with your finances and not your healthcare is the big difference, but it's different in that it is effective when you sign it and the durable power of attorney is active when you sign it. So I always tell my clients that a durable power of attorney is like money. People can go out and transact business on your behalf. Um, so it's an important document to have, but it's important. I tell people to do the document, but you don't need to give a copy to everybody. Um, keeping that and having it again, very important. You can name co-agents for the durable power of attorney. You can have two people do it. And some people like that because then there's not just one person in charge and there's somebody else that knows what's going on. You want to make sure with this document that you select someone that is trustworthy, that they are fairly organized, and that you want them to have personal, personal financial stability themselves. Um, and that doesn't mean they have to be wealthy. That just means that they are, are able to pay their bills and sustain themselves and aren't going to have to rely on any of your funds uh, to maintain their lifestyle. Um, going to the next slide, uh, trends in estate planning, and that's a little bit of an oxymoron because estate planning is probably the least trendy area of law uh, that in real estate, uh, Again, things change slowly, but uh, what uh, has happened in Wisconsin is that we no longer have an estate tax and you will hear people talk about uh, when they come into my office, one of their first questions is we want to avoid taxes and um, Wisconsin currently has no estate tax, meaning you can die leaving as much money as you want uh, to whoever you want, and there will be no estate tax. The estate tax is uh, when the government decides that uh, after your estate has reached a certain amount that uh, they're going to take uh, some tax uh, out of that estate. The federal estate tax is currently uh, approximately 13 million per person that someone can uh, leave tax free to somebody. That uh, is something that at the federal level is uh, you'll notice with an upcoming election year, uh, usually in the background, there's talk about uh, taxes and what's going to happen with taxes. And uh, the estate tax level is going to drop in 2026 to about five to six million per person. It's going to vary a little bit, um, but it'll be interesting to see with the upcoming election what uh, the conversation is regarding the estate tax. So I always tell people that for most people, it's not an issue that uh, we're not passing a, a more than, you know, 10 to 26 million dollars to our loved ones. But it's something to consider and keep an eye on and keep your ears open uh, as uh, elections happen and as you go through life and uh, it becomes a little bit more relevant. Um, I also want to uh, give to you a little bit. There's attached, there are documents, there are power of attorney documents. Uh, a healthcare and a durable. These are the statutory uh, forms provided by uh, the Department of Human Services online. For your healthcare power of attorney, you can also uh, contact most clinics and hospitals have these documents as well. Uh, it used to be that you could go in and meet with a social worker and they would walk you through the documents. You would have to contact your local hospital and find out if that's still available. But Otherwise, uh, you can usually get a copy of these documents to fill in at one of those uh, clinic or hospital, or you can go uh, to the DHS website and 
I apologize, I don't have that on the screen, but that is W, oh, I do have it on the screen. I did get that added. So there is the website. Healthcare and financial power of attorney documents are also called advanced directives um, because you are uh, planning in advance what you're uh, directing people to do. So uh, the website says ADV directives and that is why, but both of those documents are there I have attached some documents down below. Uh, there are, or they're linked. Um, there is also a document um, called uh, Authority for Disposition. And that is a document where you can uh, leave written instruction as to what you want to have happen to your remains if something happens to you. And if it's, do you want to be cremated? Do you want your ashes spread? Do you want them buried? Do you want to be buried? Do you want a natural burial? You can address all of those issues and appoint who's in charge of that. Uh, that is a separate document from your will. Some people address those issues in a will, but I tell them that's not really a good idea because uh, by the time the will gets opened, a lot of times uh, people are buried and uh, that happens later. So having these documents can be a good thing. Um, I also want to say, as far as a will goes, there is, not that I'm aware of, there's no statutory form for a will. And, but you can contact, uh, there's a Dane County Basic Estate Planning Clinic. It's uh, through Madison College, the paralegal program there. And you can call Madison College at 608-204-9642. And they have clinics throughout the year. And I volunteer at these regularly. And uh, you can, uh, you watch a video presentation and then we go through and draft a will, financial power of attorney and healthcare power of attorney for you right there. And so you can, again, call 608-204-9642. And um, that is an excellent way. It is an income-based program. There is no charge, but they will let you know whether you qualify and uh, what you need to do if you are interested in that program. So I uh, see that we have a question and maybe an answer. Um, it says, if a transfer on death document is established and parents die, the person or persons who receive that property, are they now responsible for the mortgage if there is one? And that is correct. They are responsible to ensure that the mortgage uh, is paid. And that can be a little bit of an issue in that um, if you do a transfer on death uh, deed for real estate and you have five siblings, you all have to agree on what's happening and you have to, uh, whether the house is going to be sold or repaired and rented, and you have to agree who's paying what and when. And so uh, transfer on death deeds are great. But sometimes if there are a lot of siblings, it can uh, maybe not be uh, always the best option. Uh, you can do, it looks like uh, you can do a transfer on death deed at any time. Um, if it is uh, recorded uh, and affects the property that you own. So if you do a transfer on death deed and sell the house you're in, you do have to do a new one if you buy another property. The transfer on death deed is really slick because a lot of times house was the only thing that was going through probate and it allows uh, the transfer of that asset very simply. It does not affect any uh, ownership during the person's lifetime. If I designate my children to receive my house, I can still sell that house, mortgage that house, I can revoke that and, you know, disinherit one of my kids or all of my kids. It's a very flexible uh, document. And so the other thing I want to say is um, 
if you have parents or uh, grandparents, it's always been a little bit taboo maybe to bring up uh, talking about what their estate plan is. But I do encourage you to have some conversations so that uh, do they even have these documents and what are their wishes? And uh, having some of those conversations might be awkward, but definitely uh, recommend it. Again, I just think conversations are one of the more powerful uh, uh, tools we have in our estate planning belt. Is an attorney needed to draft POA documents? If not, can families complete these documents themselves and should they be notarized? When is an attorney needed? Um, the power of attorney documents that are linked below um, can be, uh, the, they're statutory documents that have been provided for you. There are instructions on them regarding witnesses and having the documents notarized. You should not have, like for the healthcare power of attorney, you do not want to have, a healthcare provider cannot be uh, your uh, witness. And so the documents do have instructions with them. Now we have uh, our own, for example, financial power of attorney forms that we use for our clients that might ha that have some modifications for each client's individual need. Uh, as this is a basic estate planning seminar, I would definitely uh, at least have you take a look at the forms that are linked. I do believe those will be uh, those will be uh, sufficient. Uh, then I uh, we have if a transfer on death document. What can when can you do a transfer on death deed? Any time, any age. Uh, it doesn't matter. The only requirement is that you own real estate to be able to do it. Uh, if a transfer on death document is established and parents die, the person or persons, yeah, receive the mortgage. So I think we have answered all of the questions. Are there any other questions? If not, and we've answered them all, uh, thank you for attending today. And, um, I believe my contact information is uh, listed and I'm happy to have you email or call me with any questions that were not addressed uh, during this presentation.